Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. My name is Jade, and this is How to App on iOS. And today, we're going to be hanging out with... Jamie. Like Come on, Dave! From the amazing band Firetail. So strap yourselves in, because this music is fire. We're going to kick off with a track called... Apex. Let's do it.
<laughs> Lou Reality says in the chat, this music will F you up if you're baked. <laughs> the indescribable sounds of <laughs> Firetail. Now, <laughs> lock yourselves in, guys, because this, this band is a trip. This is my alley. This is my kind of world. It may not be for you, but it's for me, so <laughs> I love it. Um, let me tell you a little bit of a story, huh? So uh, last week I had uh, Ron and Jenny Wolfstone on the show. We did Behind the Song. And uh, firstly, oh, yes, hang on a minute. Welcome to you all in the chat. If you're watching on the replay, hello to you as well. This is How to App on iOS. I'm Jade, and this is our interview at the end of the week. So last week I had Ron and Jenny Wolfstone on. We did Behind the Song where we took a look at their their music behind how they made the track. And I had said to everybody, well, at the end of the show, I'm going to get my dreadlocks removed. And I thought, uh, that, you know, they were super long. We're going to get them all done. I've got a I've got the hairdresser coming out to my house to uh, sort my, my dreads out. And who knew that not only was this amazing hairdresser who came out to fix my hair and did a marvellous job played in a sick band and um it was really cool because we we pretty much sat there and we we're talking about music and drugs and rock and roll as you do when you're a musician and um it turned out that uh not only did i get my hair fixed which was awesome but uh we got a new guest on the show and somebody to totally new to this community you know we hear so many uh people from around this community week in and week out which is lovely and I love that. You guys know I love that. But it's always nice to have somebody from outside of the YouTuber sphere come in and talk about their music. So without further ado, I'm glad you could all join me today. We're going to find out more about this fascinating human being and their music. So um, now you guys remember during the week I was having a bit of trouble pronouncing Jamie's name. I was saying uh, Jamie uh, Ma Mac Macellini, Mac Macella, and I screwed it up heaps of times. And today I'm going to say it. <laughs> it's Jamie Macellini. <laughs> I'm going to say it like that, like a fucking Aussie, mate. Uh, so let's bring him onto the show. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, let's welcome Jamie onto the show from Firetail. Boom. Hey, everybody. Morning, evening, wherever you are. Thanks for having me, Jade. Not a problem. Thanks for coming on. Hey, thanks for getting up so early in the morning being an Aussie here in Melbourne. I know. It's not very rock and roll, is it? No, it isn't. <laughs> it sucks. It is every day. But uh, thanks for coming on the show, and um, yeah, and uh, I'm, to I'm sure people are going to be totally fascinated by your style of music. I'm going to just th throw it out there. The first question, normally I, I go in a different direction, but I like changing things up. How would you describe your music? Oh, that's a tough one. <laughs> um, uh, it's definitely psychedelic. Yeah. It's definitely psychedelic. Uh, <laughs> You know, um, it's sort of like my my art, which you can sort of, you know, see behind me. I sort of say to people, it's like the drugs finally paid off. Uh, I feel like that just sort of seeps through through art, through music. It's like it's it's jazzy for sure, because we do lots of improvising. Um, a lot of us in the band, we sort of come from like, you know, that that, that jazz world background, um, uh, except for our, our percussionist, uh, Keshev, who his background is Sri Lankan and he plays much more of that um, South Indian um, sort of percussion. So that's a bit of a, you know, East meets West uh, clash that we have in the band where a lot of the band members will, will talk, you know, will talk in, um, in, western you know jazz theory sort of you know language and he doesn't speak that language he he sort of speaks in the language of rhythm he does this thing he he actually sort of does this thing it's called south indian carnetic singing you've probably heard it before it's where they it's where instead of uh you know feeling music like we might feel it like you know like one two three four they have a whole different sort of uh language um, like, which is, you know, Taka, Dina, Dom sort of, um, right. and, they, and, and, and he uses that to sing whilst playing. So, you know, so there's that, um, but yeah, otherwise 
Yeah, it's a it's a tough one to describe because we we mix it up and we work with so many different guests as well. So whoever we're working with, if it's a singer or if it's a, you know a rapper or um, or a you know a spoken word artist, we try to we try to just make music which is going to highlight highlight what they're doing and you know make them shine the brightest. Um, and when we're doing just instrumental, then we just have fun and we just do whatever the whatever the fuck we want to do and what feels good. <laughs> <laughs> that's the, that's how your music should be. Whatever the fuck you feel. That's, that's it. <laughs> um, let's stick with the easy questions. <laughs> I, I joke. <laughs> um, what does music mean to you, Jamie? Oh, everything. Literally, my whole world. Um, yeah, it's, I can't remember, I just, I remember my earliest memories, because no one, you know, I grew up, I grew up in, you know, in a family where everyone loved music, but no one played music. So there was right. no, there was no one playing instruments, there was, you know, there was no one, you know, in the family doing that. And yeah, my earliest memories are me just listening to music and dancing and just being like, you know, just the way that it made me feel. I mean, I'm lucky because, I, you know, as a, as a hairdresser, you, you know, I talk, to, I talk to a lot of people every single day. I'm doing their hair. You get a chance to really, you know, chat and get to know people. And I've been doing that for about 14 years. And, you know, you sort of become a therapist for a lot of people. <laughs> I hope I wasn't that. <laughs> not you, Jade. Not you. Not you. <laughs> Help me with my life and my next and door neighbour. <laughs> and don't worry. Whatever happens in our in our hairdressing sessions, that stays there. I won't. I, I won't put that on the internet. Awesome. I did sign that that <laughs> privacy contract with you. <laughs> but my other customers, I'll talk about them. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> you, we talked about this. Let's. I want to continue on that line. We you, we talked about this when you're doing my hair. How dreadlocks. And, and being a hairdresser has really helped you connect with art and people and and such. You know, like you were even talking about um, walking when you when you're looking for customers, right? I remember yeah. you saying this: how like it's really easy as a dreadlock hairdresser to find customers because all you have to do is walk down the fucking street and see. There they are. <laughs> so, how does being a hairdresser? How has it helped you, like uh, with music and, and meeting musicians? Has it played a part in that? Oh, this well, this project, Firetail, it's amazing. Um, you you really don't you, like you don't have to scratch very far under the surface and there's this dreadlock connection, which is everywhere. Yep. Um, so Kesh, who I mentioned before, um, who plays percussion, he was the first member to join and me and him had been jamming in some other projects and he has long, beautiful dreadlocks. And I was like, Hey man, I do dreadlocks. Come in, come in sometime and I'll, I'll, I'll fix your hair. And he was sitting in my chair and we were talking about music and I was like, I want to start a band. And that's, that's how he got involved. Um, there's this lovely woman, Miwa, and she was, she sang on our very first single. Same thing. She's, um, she's a Canadian singer songwriter. And I met her at a festival and we were just chatting and she had a few, a few dreads in the back. And I mentioned, I'm a hairdresser. I'll do your hair. So she came in and we just talked music, just like just like you and I were. And um, lo and behold, you know, she had a beautiful voice. I played her some of my demos and we decided to work together. The person that was in that film clip that we just watched, um, the, 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 the wizard looking man who was eating the mushrooms, <laughs> he's actually my, he was my flatmate at the time. And he, I moved into this share house and he had set up a studio um, in the garage and he had dreadlocks. So the first two EPs that we recorded, he basically did the recordings, um, on a barter system where I would fix his hair. Um, <laughs> so that's how that happened. Uh, Maya who sang on our last EP, she's, um, a great soul singer. She's actually, she just, 
you know, um, she's just been doing really well in the Australian Australian Idol. She just got to the top twelve. Yeah, I, I saw that. Yeah, so you know, she's doing well in that in that world. Um, but I do her father's dreadlocks, so you know, it's just there's uh, oh, and and also there's um, there's a um, this amazing spoken word artist Sizway from South Africa. Uh, I, I've been doing his dreadlocks for a few years and. We just connected instantly on on you know on um on art because you know it's a doing dre- doing someone's hair. Uh, I th- I feel like when you are touching someone's head, it's such a personal, intimate space, and I think it goes back to when we were you know when we were all monkeys, and that's how we used to socially were. Maybe some of us still are. <laughs> yeah. It's not very far back, you know, but like a short distance back in time when we were all hanging out and, you know, picking nits and lice out of each other's head. Uh, that's how we connected socially. That's how we sort of formed bonds. And that's how we sort of said to each other, you're okay with me. Come over here. You know, you can do my hair. I'll do yours. So there is a really strong connection that happens in that space. And um, so often like with yourself and I, so often, very, very quickly, you know, within, within the first 20 minutes, you're just like, oh, this person's amazing. I like this person. Uh, and you connect very, very quickly. And yeah, it's very, it's, you know, it's been great for, uh, for Firetail. It's just, uh, it's, a, it's, a pool, it's a pool of creatives that I get to sort of, you know, just delve into. Cold Acre right? So this is how you recruit musicians. <laughs> Apparently, yeah. <laughs> so, so if you're interested in, in uh, becoming a part-time singer on one of their songs, uh, just uh, get your hair done. No, I found it really interesting too. I'd never had anybody actually come to my house to do my hair before. I, I've always gone to salons, you know. Um, and, you know, you, 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 if I had come to see you in a salon, we probably wouldn't have got into that much of a deep conversation as well because – You've got other customers you have to go to and you're being paid by somebody. So there was that, you know, ability to just relax, you know, and and chill. And, you know, I felt kind of weird. I I, I hate playing my music for people anyway. Like I, I don't I don't like doing that. So I remember I was playing you some of my songs going, oh, God, I must sing like a wanker right now. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> but it was um, – I do it all the time. I th- like. I figure, hey, if you're in my chair in my house, we're going to listen to the like to the latest song that I've just. Uh, because people always ask, you know, people always sort of. You, you get into that conversation. Oh, is this all you do? Is it just hair? And you go, oh no, I also I play music. And they're like, what's your music like? And and I think I could sit here and Uh-oh. try to describe it badly, like I just did before. <laughs> I could sort of say, well, it's. Uh, or I could just be like, let me just hit play and then you can you can listen and you can hear for yourself. Yeah, you make up what you think. Um, yeah, it, that's, it, you even, tell me. Because even when I was writing a description for your music, I was like, man, I'm just going to put indescribable. Yeah, that'll do. Because let, let other people make up their minds. I do that for my own music too. Indescribable, you make it up. I don't really care. Because, you know, people have such – it's like when you write lyrics, you know, you write a story. A, a story with lyrics, you put it out there to the world and then you have these people go, I really love that song, how it's about this. And you're like, how the fuck did you get that from what I wrote? (laughs) What? Well, you have so many, you you have so many projects. So that must be, that must be nice to be able to uh, sort of, you know, um, take each project and, and I suppose, think, okay, this is my, my doom, hardcore, you know, uh, <laughs> trash project, which I can, you know, put a little bit of that energy towards that. Whereas I only, I only have fire tales, so everything sort of gets thrown into the one thing for me. I'd love to have everything thrown into one thing. I think we share similar, you know, our likes of artists. Like Mr. As soon as you, like I knew you liked Mr. Bungle, I was like, what? All right. This is a rare day. <laughs> you know, yes. It's very rare you come across somebody in the street and say, is it Mr. Bungle? And they're like, yes. And yes. It doesn't happen very much. A very unique band. Um, I want to ask you, let's go back. Let's go back in time. And I want to ask you, 
uh, growing up. Now you're from Queensland, yes. Grew up yep. in Queensland. So, growing up in your household in Queensland, do you remember some of the music that was played by your folks in the house as a kid? Who were yes. they? Um, so, my my dad, he's a bit of a weird case. He was a <laughs> miner, so he used to work in the mines back in you know back in the day, and he was a football player. Right. But he also he loved classical music. So when he was 18 years old, he'd be, you know, working in the mines and blasting classical music to, and all the miners would be like, what the hell is going on here? <laughs> so in our house, we used to, every Sunday morning, he would play classical music. That was his thing. And he also, he's got a great, a great record collection. He's got, um, he loved Leonard Cohen. Leonard Cohen was, was getting a lot of play. All the classics, all the um, all the old rock stuff, um, uh, lots of the old psychedelic, you know, rock bands from the '60s and the '70s. Um, but so yeah, so so growing up, that's you know, like that was my parents. My because I was, I was the youngest, I had three older brothers and an older sister, so I also got a lot of my musical influence from them. Right. Uh, you know. My older brother bought me my, my first CD when I was nine years old, which was Pantera, Barbie on Driven. So <laughs> as a nine-year-old, I was like, holy shit. <laughs> what the fuck just happened? What the hell just happened there? <laughs> uh, so he got me into metal, you know, White Zombie, um, Fear Factory, Sepultura, um, you know, of course, Metallica, all that sort of stuff, Nirvana, the Violent Femmes. Um, my, my my other brother, he was a big lover of you know Bob Dylan, uh, all that old sort of like folky folky sort of stuff from the sixties. Um, my my other brother, he really loved punk. He was a big punk fan. Um, that sort of skater punk, you know, no effects, bad religion, that suicidal sort of stuff. tendencies, suicidal tendencies, you know, friends will rom, all that Australian sort of, you know, yep, skater punk. So yeah, so it, it was quite the mix, um, and you know, yeah, it was good because I sort of, you know, every, 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 everything has its place. Sunday mornings, that's when you listen to classical. <laughs> Bru- <laughs> is that a rule? Is it? <laughs> that's a, that's a rule. <laughs> We'll have to add that to that song. What's that song uh, I used to hear on AM radio? Like Monday is washing day, Tuesday is chicken. <laughs> it was like the, something from the fifties that people used to live by what they eat. And yeah. Sunday is classical. Yeah, we'll have to add that to the list. Um, so you mentioned that Pantera was the first album uh, uh, CD. Uh, yeah, well, no, well, that was the first CD um, that I own. My yeah. brother bought it for me. Yeah. For- for a present, the first CD that I ever uh, bought with my own money, I was yeah. about I was about ten years old, and I went out. I I, I saved thirty dollars, and I went and bought um, Faith No More, King for a Day. Oh man, what an album! But I didn't actually get to keep that album because I took it home, and my my father he listened to it, and then he he got the the booklet and he read the lyrics. And so he would never swear at home. He was he was big on not swearing. Right. And so he, he came into my bedroom and I was sitting in my bedroom and he, and he said, Jamie, do you think this sounds appropriate for someone your age? And then he took out the <laughs> lyrics and he said, happy birthday, fucker. You're, you're the best fuck that I've ever had. And that coming out of his mouth, it was like, oh, that's really disturbing what you're... <laughs> When when Mike Patton sings it, it sounds cool. When you're reading it to me slowly, <laughs> it's really, really not cool. So he made me return that CD. I had to go and return no. it. No, dollars back. And then I bought I bought Green Day Dookie. Oh no! What a what a replacement. <laughs> but that had swearing in it as well. And then he gave up. He gave up after that. That was his one. His you know he 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 decided that he needed to battle me on that. After that, he gave up and he was like, all right, whatever. You can just, you know, do, do, do what you will. Man, I was dis- I'll was i be honest. When that Faith No More album came out, I was like, oh, man. 
It had had Trace Bruins playing on it for Mr. Bungle. I expected so much more, and then it came out and dropped, and I was I was so disappointed. But it it was one of those Faith No More albums that the more I listened to it, it grew on me, and I understood why Trey kind of wasn't Mr. Bungle on it because it wasn't Mr. Bungle's Faith No More. You That's know, right. you, you got to you got to remember they are different, and and Mike had to do the same thing, and it's probably why there's so much contra- controversy between Mr. Bungle and and Faith No More because people wanted that for some reason. People heard Mr. Bungle then wanted Faith No More to be Mr. Bungle, and it was silly. Um, mm. And something else you touched on there, like people, excuse me, people wouldn't be aware of this. CDs here in Australia. Because of the, the ridiculous, I don't know if it was because of the exchange rate of coin, cost us 30 bucks when they first came out. Yeah. It was insane. Oh, like you would see in the US, like a new album comes out and it's like $11. And I'm like, why is it $30 here? Like, even, when, even before CDs, vinyl was about $20. 20 to 22 imports were about... Thirty, thirty-five dollars, um, because we we because we're on this island. To get imported metal here was crazy. Like you know, you're a fair bit younger than me. For me to get like a, a Sepultura album when they first came out, it cost like thirty-nine dollars on vinyl. It was just ludicrous. Um, mm. We live in a shit hole sometimes. Even to discover new music, because where I was living. At that time, it was a, a very small little country town, uh, two hours from anywhere, and we didn't get uh, our national radio station, Triple J, so we couldn't listen to um, the radio that actually played sort of, you know, new alternative music. Yep. Um, we didn't have, you know, YouTube or the internet. Um, so if I wanted to discover new music, I would go and buy a magazine and read about bands and then go, oh, they, they look cool and they sound cool. Then I'd go to the store and order their CD, which would take three weeks yeah. to arrive. And then I'd, look, I'd put it on and listen to it and go, oh, this is shit. <laughs> and I just spent all this money and waited a month. Um, so antique. <laughs> I know. It's crazy. <laughs> It's amazing we we that um we that uh, seasoned in music we're having to grow up that way you know uh, yeah. my friend James just wrote here Cold Acre wrote uh, uh at Metal for Melbourne CD at Metal for Melbourne was thirty three dollars and you know both me and James grew up here in Melbourne and we had a specific shop called Metal for Melbourne where that's the only place you could get metal from no nowhere else like yeah. the, all the normal cd shops would be like what metallica what are you talking about who is this <laughs> nonsense and these days rock is everywhere you know yeah. so that's what i call them now because they are no longer metal and it is what it is no. i'm going to play a, another track and then we'll come back and say hello to all the fine folks who are here in the chat um i'm going to choose rainbow room do you want to tell us about this track that i'm about to play Sure. So um, this one's pretty experimental. <laughs> um, this this tune, this this whole tune came. I I, had, I have this great pedal, um, this delay pedal, and I was jamming with my drummer, and we literally just said, "Hey, what happens if we get all the knobs, and we just crank them all to you know the the max, and then I just I just you know brushed the string of my bass." just with, you know, the tip of my finger. And it made this huge, amazing sound. And that's what we based this song on. We got Emily Bennett, um, a, a vocalist who also sang on a, another tune of ours, So Skinny. She's a really sort of avant-garde, experimental vocalist. And she just does stream of conscious um, sort of, uh, you know, stuff. And we just got her to come in. She did about 20 different vocal tracks. And then we just chopped them all up, spliced them together fucked with the sound, and then it, you know, came out with Rainbow Room. Awesome. Let's do it, folks. Uh, chill, chillax for, uh, we've got about uh, three, close to four minutes. We'll come back, say hello to you all. Enjoy this track. Get ready for a bit of avant-garde. Oh, yeah. Let's do it.
it's so rare, right, that I meet somebody, they tell me about their music, and they say, oh, we're really, like, avant-garde and we're off the wall and, you know, we're, we're hard to describe what we are, that I then go and actually listen to them and they are avant-garde and off the wall and... I think people's uh, idea of avant-garde <laughs> sometimes is a little bit like, you sure? You're not that weird. Um, but when I heard Firetail, I was like, oh, man, straight in my collection with John Zorn, all the weird shit that I listen to. Like if people saw my music collection, they'd be like, what the fuck do you listen to? Really? <laughs> what What is wrong with your brain? <laughs> but just crazy. Nah, like do you, do you have that issue when people like ask you, like, uh, what what are your fan base like when they come to see you live? Uh, is it a mixture of weird people? Uh, <laughs> I'm interested to know. Certainly. Um, it is, yeah, it's, it's, it's so awesome to, you know, when you, because we have people, you know, I mean, if we can, if we can blow some minds from a live show, then we're doing a good job. Um, and you know, people do come up and they, and they say that to us, they, you know, one thing that we get a lot is I've never heard anything like that. And that to me is the biggest compliment that we can possibly have. It's like amazing. (laughs) So, you know, then we know we're doing something right. When when you're writing music, is, is that a goal? Like, or is it just what feels right or, you know, is there an underlying feel of like, you know, we want this to sound like this particular genre with this and this or does it just happen and you just go with it? No, it just, it just happens. Um, you know, we, we actually try not to, you know, try to not do, you know, like every genre, you know what I mean? Like we don't yeah. want to be like, you know, Wayne where we're going from like a country song to a drum and bass tune to a, you know, um, but uh, it's just, uh, you know, we just get, you know, as musicians, we get influenced by whatever we're listening to at the time. And then you just try to, uh, you know, make something that's along that sort of vein, but not rip it off completely and then add your own spin to it. And, you know, I like it, whoever brings in the, 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 the tune for the band, it's never really, um, it's, it's never really like a, a set thing. Like I, I won't come into the band and be like, okay, here's the parts, drums, you do this, uh, you know, sax, you're doing that. I'll come in and I'll be like, here's a, here's a bass riff I've got. Um, you know, maybe there's a melody. And then I just let everyone else do whatever they want to do. <laughs> and I, I get out of their way. And only if there's a point where, you know, we might feel a bit stuck. Then I'll come in and be like, well, let's try this or let's try that. But if everyone in the band, if they're feeling it and they're like, oh, yeah, okay, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to add this, I'm going to add that. I just try to stay out of their way and let them do their thing. I love that uh, a concept. Uh, let's say hello to the folks who are here in the chat. Hello, Felcro. Welcome aboard. Hello, Cold Acre. Many vibes. Uh, Russ8889. Who else do we have here? Thomas Christ. Uh, La Reality, what's going on? Joe and Barry Glenn are here. Well, Joe's here at least. That's Joe. Scott Borthwick, hello to you. Uh, let's see who else I may have missed in the... Oh, just just spam the chat, guys, so I can see you. Gregory O'Sullivan says, Yawn, I'm awake now because you're in Australia. Um, so spam me in the chat so I don't have to scroll too far. I know I'm missing names here. Let me scroll. Kim Harden Hudson, what's going on? Hello, hello. Uh, I'm saying ah too many times. Arr. Who else do I see here? Steve-O, what's going on? Welcome to the show. Uh, who's from LA? Good afternoon to you. Wolfstone Studio, Ron from Wolfstone. Jenny Jolivet from Wolfstone Studio as well. There's um, Princess LDG who says she needs to get on the treadmill. Thanks for letting us know that. <laughs> I love live streaming, man. Uh, it's good stuff. Uh, Mateus, what's going on, my friend? Thank you all for being here. And remember, if you are watching the replay, welcome aboard. Hope you enjoy the rest of the show. And, you know, hit the like, do all that stuff. Make the algorithms happy on YouTube. It, it makes 
YouTube happy makes me happy, makes us all happy. And what do we want? We want happiness in this world, not the dreariness of the news and all the other crap that goes on. What was the first gig you went to growing up in Queensland? I would love to know what this was. John Farnham. <laughs> no way. The voice. The voice. <laughs> I went with my mum and... Uh, <laughs> And it, I, I'd never seen anything like it before. Uh, <laughs> yeah. All, all these women would bring their bras and underwear and throw it on the stage. Just <laughs> hundreds of them. Yeah. And I, I remember thinking to myself, I was about nine or ten, and I thought, what does he do with all those bras? Does he have a room <laughs> at his house that he just takes them all back and he's got like a giant bra room? And... Um, one woman brought she she had hand crocheted like a little a little um like sort of g-string dick warmer and he put that in <laughs> and he seemed to really like that i i i reckon that piece was going to actually make it to his you know pride of place at the home <laughs> the man cave the, the man cave. <laughs> for those of you who don't know john farnham a great singer great singer like you can't deny it. fantastic voice Aussie legend. Uh, yeah. Uh, but, you know, hey, it wasn't my style of music, but you have to give the dude props. Great singer, fantastic voice. Is he still – I thought the last time I heard he he was, like, sick and he can't sing anymore. Is that a Possibly. thing? Is I that mean, a thing? the tour that we went and saw when I was nine, that was called The Last Time <laughs> Tour. And that was <laughs> – that was definitely not the last time. That was a bit of false advertising. Well, that's been one of the memes for years uh, yeah. in this country. He's done so many final tours. The farewell tour, yeah. the last tour. <laughs> the, the, the final tour, the goodbye tour. Yeah. And, and he, it's just like uh, he needs to do a will you fuck off already tour. Yeah. Like just, <laughs> just pull the trigger, motherfucker, and get the hell out of here. Uh, but... You know, what a what a cool uh, voice to go and see for your first gig. You know what's funny is I actually ended up getting bass lessons from his bass player then, Craig Strain, who's an amazing bass player. He plays jazz fusion. And he teaches, along with most of the um, John Farnham band, they teach uh, at the Victoria College of Arts, which is where I went and studied music. So, yeah, years and years later... My first concert, I ended up getting lessons from the man himself, Craig. It's interesting. Uh, both when you said that when you were here doing my dreadlocks, I didn't even bring that up, but I went to Victorian College of Arts as well. So we're both Did you? we're both VCA students. We're alumni. <laughs> yes, we are. So um, it's that's really rare. I hardly meet anybody who um, uh, did that. I think I went to SE, uh, the the School of Audio Engineering in Sydney as well. That was um, short lived. I hate those things. The school, the school of audio engineering. They always, they encourage you to bring bands in to do demos of, and and the bands yeah. you get to come in, they, they expect the world, and because yes. you're only learning, they <laughs> end up leaving, going, it's not very good. It's like, I'm learning. It's my first day. <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> what did you expect? Do you think I'm like some huge producer? Um, but uh, having uh, bass lessons uh, from it's, it's fascinating because John Farnham is well-renowned, and a lot of artists like Marsha Hines, all these Australian uh, fantastic singers, always have some of the most amazing backing artists, uh, mm. vocalists, like who are everywhere, uh, some yeah. of these backing vocalists and musicians that you know just play with all these great singers. So to have someone like that is just sick. One of the drummers in my band would play had uh, Virgil Donati giving him drum lessons. And um, I just didn't give a shit about uh, our drummer anymore. I just wanted to meet Virgil Donati when I found that out. So um, let's continue on because I lived in oh, well, I lived in Queensland for a little while. I lived in um, uh, in, in Brisbane, in uh, Red Hill, uh, uh, yep. and um, lots of spy orb spiders everywhere. And I uh, used to go to gigs and used to love it. Uh, what What is did, – did you ever play gigs in Queensland? Was it a thing when you were growing up or did you move to Melbourne uh, before then? When I was 15 uh, in high school, we I formed my first band. Right. Um, and we used to go and play like, you know, 
Battle of the Bands and stuff like that in Townsville because um, we were up north a little bit. So, yeah, like, like uh, that's where I sort of cut my teeth performing, but, um, but only like, you know, only, only a handful of shows. As soon as I turned 17 and I got my driver's license, within two weeks I had my bases in the car and I drove the three and a half thousand kilometers to Melbourne to, uh, you know, get into the music scene down here. Because it's interesting, isn't it? Because Melbourne's always been known as the music scene. That's right. Um, I, I grew up here, so I was lucky. Uh, I, I really took it for granted as a kid because you could get gigs here at the, the Tote, the Corner, Art House, all these great places. And when I moved to Sydney it, when I was 30, wow, it was really different because there was nowhere to play. And when you could get a gig, it was tough. Um, because yeah. nobody came out to see you. Yeah, it's it's a it's it's Melbourne is great. I mean, I've you know I've done a bunch of traveling around the world, and you know everywhere I go, I always try to seek out you know live music and what's going on. So you know you're in places like Berlin, you know Paris, Amsterdam, Istanbul, um, and. They've got great music scenes and they've got great stuff going on. But I always think to myself, you know what? Melbourne holds its own compared to all of these other, you know, cities around the world. Melbourne's got a great live music scene. It's thriving. It can be Monday night and you can go out and you can catch, you know, a live Latin band uh, playing, you know, somewhere in a small little club. There's always something going on. The only issue is that Melbourne is, you know, uh, so far from any other cities. So once you've sort of, um, the problem is, is that, you know, you can't play in Melbourne every single week and expect to get a crowd, you know? Um, and then the options for touring in Australia are a bit tricky because like you said, there's Sydney, which is an eight hour drive away. And there's not even really much happening there with the live music and there's, Adelaide, which is also eight hours drive away. Um, so, you know, I mean, Europe and America, they've got that. They've got, you know, you, you can jump in the car and you can go from city to city to city to city uh, and tour a lot easier than you can in Australia. We're going on tour this month and next month doing a lot of regional stuff, which is fun. Um, so, like, we are going to get out there and, 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 and give it a crack. Well, yeah, talking about touring, do you think that's the best way to do it here in Australia? Uh, to because, as you said, you're right. Uh, there's so many gigs on in Melbourne. There's and you know most nights you're going to get people there. Does you know no matter how many you're going to get people there. Um, but do you find going on tour, hitting those regional areas, is the best way to go? Because you know people are starved for music out there. Yeah. Um... We, this will be the first time taking Firetail right. on, on tour. I've done it with, 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 with a few other bands in Australia. And, yeah, you're right. People, you know, um, I mean, you know, it depends, I think. It depends on the town. I remember we, we were in North Queensland a few years ago in Townsville, which is where I, you know, where I grew up. And... I was in this, you know, this really sort of like um, this sort of dance circusy piratey uh, band, and they didn't want a bar of it. They wanted the ACDC covers. <laughs> they were like, "What the fuck is this shit?" You know, play some Akadaka. So there's a bit of that, <laughs> but uh, you know, if you don't give it a, if you don't, I mean, as long as you're, as long as you're reaching someone, uh, I think it's worthwhile, and also it's fun. You know, that's why, that's what I want to do. I want to, I want to travel and be on the road with my band and, you know, go and go and play some fun gigs. So that's why we do it. I found it interesting. When I lived in the US, I lived in Minneapolis and out of all the places I've traveled around the world as well, I found Minneapolis to be probably the closest thing to Melbourne that I've ever found. And that I think I found the reason why is because it's so fucking cold there. Right, and it's so cold in Melbourne at times. And even when it was snowing and it was minus like six degrees, I went to a gig on a Tuesday night, some gig with like six death metal bands who nobody had heard of, 
And there was like 300 people. <laughs> just yeah. like, what are you motherfuckers doing? It's so cold. There's icicles dripping off your nose. But I think that's the same thing with Melbourne. People just, like, they just don't give a fuck about the weather. They just want to hear music and go out. I know it's a bit tougher now because things have changed a little bit. Poker machines and all that kind of thing uh, have made a dent in music. But uh, it's. I think the weather is huge. I think the weather is a massive thing. I mean, up in North Queensland, um, so that so that film clip before Rainbow Room, that footage is where I'm from, up in up near Cairns, and it's very tropical and very steamy, and the music it's it's reggae, you know. That's it's the it's the music for the climate. People want to have that sort of reggae thing. That's what they enjoy dancing to, and I've I've always said that as well. I, I feel like in Melbourne. It's, it, it, it is the shitty weather that, you know, people get stuck inside during winter and they get creative and they write and they paint and they do stuff. Whereas if the weather's too nice, people just tend to go to the beach and drink beer. And, uh, <laughs> you know, why wouldn't you? You just hang out and have a good time. Whereas down here, because it's so shitty, you got to do something to keep yourself occupied. Might as well write a song. Absolutely. Um, and speaking of song, let's play another song and we'll come back and talk further. I'm going to play now Bamboo. Do you want to tell us a little bit about this before we jump in and play it? Sure. So um, as I mentioned earlier, this is the first single that we released and uh, it features the amazing vocals of Miwa. She's sort of like a neo-soul singer. Um, I met her at a festival and this was a dreadlock connection. Uh, I, was her, I, I was her hairdresser. And, um, and yeah, I brought her into the studio. We recorded in our garage. Um, and yeah, uh, this was during the lockdowns in Melbourne that we released this. So the film clip is sort of, you know, sent to a friend and it's all done without actually seeing each other. And we just sort of made do with what we had. All righty. Let's play it right now. Guys, right. kick back, relax. We'll see you back here shortly. Let's do it. This is... Bamboo from Firetail.
Wow. If you don't feel good after that, you've got no feelings. <laughs> you need to be punched. <laughs> um, I really love how, like, there, there's just so, there's so much catchiness to that as well. It's really just a beautiful groove. But there's that moment where you guys just go, and here we go. Here's that section where we're all just going to go batshit crazy and just fill it full of noise where it becomes, not noise. I, when I say noise, I class noise as music. I, I, I like noise, um, but it just becomes a soundscape almost that everybody's doing their own thing and it just becomes a wall of soundscape and then it all just pulls back to the groove again. Just beautiful stuff. And everybody in the chat agrees with me. Um, just wonderful, wonderful stuff. Um, let's go back to talking about like uh, education and stuff. Uh, so, you know, you, know, you did a uh, uh, Victorian College of Arts, but like, what was, was there a music uh, learning ability in primary school there in Queensland? Did you, th th I'm getting to, did you have to learn the recorder? Um, oh, I've got, oh, I've got, I bought a recorder about two months ago. <laughs> awesome. Yes. And because uh, I was at a gig and uh, my friend, Leif, he just, he was doing this sort of, it's like a, it was like a bit of a, you know, bluegrass thing. And all of a sudden he played this amazing solo and I was like, what the hell was that thing? I thought it was maybe like a tin whistle or something. And he was like, oh, it's a recorder. And I'd never heard a recorder sound so good because, you know, <laughs> you probably had the same thing. Like when I was in primary school, that's what you had to play the recorder. Yeah. And we used to have, there was a big bucket where they'd put all the mouthpieces in the one bucket of disinfectant. Oh. And you, had to, you had to reach in and pull out your mouthpiece. And it was like, ooh. Fuck off. Disgusting. Um, so, yeah, I just went and bought one. And I've been practicing my recorder to my to my girlfriend's, like, she's not happy about it. She's like, shut the fuck up with that recorder. <laughs> So, but I'm gonna I'm gonna keep on going. So the next Firetail album, you'll hear a little recorder on there. I reckon a little cameo solo by me. Excellent. We love the recorder. Every, you know, it's, it's the gateway drug. That's right. <laughs> um, no, my, like like from 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 when I was younger, I got piano lessons when I was six, but only for about only for about two months, and that was it. Um, I begged my parents to buy me a bass when I was nine years old because we moved to this town and I loved music and I'd met a guitarist and a drummer and the guitarist's older brother had a bass, which I played. And I was like, Oh, this is, this is what I want. So I begged them for about a year. They finally gave in to my insistent begging. Um, and no, I, I, I failed music in high school. I failed music. And I failed art um, and they tried to kick me out because I had dreadlocks. So, uh, and they're the three big things in my life now that I do. Whereas, you know, the system was like, no, 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 you're not good at that. You're not good at that and get rid of that shit. So, and now, you know, now that I'm a grown man and I look back on that, I'm sort of glad that I had that little system to fight against because, you know, that's what makes you who you are. You know, um, being able to rage against the machine. So, um, no, my my musical education when we were when I was in high school, what we used to do for about the last two years, uh, my friend Jeff, who I still collaborate with now, he's a, he, he was a singer back in my high school band, and we still do stuff t together to this day. We used to go to school. We'd get signed off the roll. Would then jump the fence and skip school, go to my girlfriend's place, buy some wine and smoke some weed. And we had a little jam room and we would practice our rock moves for hours. <laughs> and then we'd go back to school and we'd jump the fence and we'd get signed off again. So we never got busted. No one ever knew we were skipping school, but that's literally what we did for the last two years. So it's no wonder I failed music because I was never at the classes. <laughs> Look, I, I think... Um... I, I think it's a common thread. I, I was the same thing. I art, you know, I was pretty good at art. I can draw and do all that kind of stuff. Um, I can paint, but in art classes at school, oh, we, I butted heads with every teacher and, and the people that were shit seemed to always be propped up. And the same with music. Like in, in my, I went to a tech school here. It was like a pretty much a 
So tech schools here in Australia, if you don't know, guys, uh, they do trades, a lot of trade stuff. But the tech school I went to was very focused on media studies. Uh, they had a radio station there, full um, theater production, uh, theaterettes and music courses. But even like with the music, I, I was doing theater and I was doing a music course and I was playing in their school band. And what we did was every Friday, we'd go and play at other people's schools. And we were doing really well. Like the, we were playing girls' schools and the girls were screaming like we were rock stars and shit, you know. And I got suspended from school because they got a report that I wore a chain from my nose ring to my ear. And they're like, you, you represented the school with a chain going from your nose to your ear. And I'm like, motherfucker, you should have seen the girls screaming. <laughs> like, what is your problem? And they suspended me for a week for having a, a, a chain. Like, it's yeah, just uh, the school didn't understand, man. They didn't understand that shit. Uh, like that was rock and roll. Um so let's let's talk about uh, let's talk about um, playing. How, how did Firetail begin? How did how did you get it all off the ground? Uh, was was it a band in the first place? No, it wasn't. It was. It's something I've wanted to do forever um, because I'm a bass player so I'm, I'm you know I was playing in a bunch of bands and I still am as a bass player um, so all different styles of music all different genres but you know as the bass player you're always you know you're in the back holding down the groove and the front the front person is you know doing their doing their thing and I, I, I like I just had all these songs that I'd written over the years, all these little jams, all these little tunes. And in the back of my mind, I was like, one day I'll, I'll start, you know, I'll start a thing. Um, but I, I, and I, I, from studying music and from gigging in Melbourne, I, I know so many amazing musicians, but I always felt really bad to, I felt, uh, yeah, like I felt, um, uneasy about asking people to join my band because a band's a relationship. It's like asking someone to go out with you. Yeah. And there's the fear of rejection. <laughs> what if I, what if I ask someone I respect a lot if they want to, you know, play drums and they go, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'll feel devastated. <laughs> so that's what was holding me back. And, um, I, so I was living in the share house and, my flatmate, he had a recording studio at our house. So it was such a great opportunity that I was living in a studio. So I thought what I'll do to, you know, um, to stop myself from being rejected, I will start a project where I would ask musicians, um, different musicians, uh, I would ask them if they'd like to come in and all I'd ask is we do one two hour rehearsal and I'll bring in an, an idea. And in that two hours, we'll flesh it out and we'll write a song. Then they'll come back in one week and we'll do one two hour recording. And that's that. We'll record the song. I'll make a little video on my phone and would we'll post it up, not really master it or, you know, it was just about doing it quick and not getting too bogged down in things being perfect. And so that's how Firetail started. It was a recording project. I'd get in different musicians every couple of weeks. We'd do different songs. And then we started to, um, I started to book live shows and it was the same sort of idea. There was no one in the band. I would just ask whoever was available. I'd say, hey, you know, I've got a gig. Do you want to come and play drums? Do you want to come and play guitar? So for the first six months or the first year, most gigs, it was different musicians and it was very, very loose. And, and then the same musicians after a while, they just kept on saying yes to every single live show. <laughs> and once we started playing, you know, maybe three or four shows in a row as the same musicians, then when someone couldn't make it, say the drummer couldn't make the next one, we really felt, oh, it's not the same. It's, you know, it was, it was, it, it, it's, it's obviously better the more that you play together. So I finally bit the bullet and I asked all the, all those people in the band, I said, would you like to <laughs> be in the band and we will be a band? And they all said, yes. 
and here we are, happy, happy band about four years later. It's a really good way to work. I, I've worked the same way with my one of my projects called Utensils. We used to hire out a hall in Brunswick, this huge just hall, and we'd just have all these phone numbers of people and we'd call random phone numbers and get them out and we'd record stuff. And and that's the same way. We looked at it like a football team. You had a, whole, a book full of numbers and you just called random numbers and whatever you did on that night was how it worked. And over time... The people who aren't really into it just drop off and disappear and the people who dig doing this weird shit they stick around. Stay on. And exactly. and it's, it's like you find your brethren of weirdos and you're good to go. That's a yeah. good name for a band, actually. Brethren of weirdos. R- write that down. <laughs> I am right now. <laughs> that, that, that can be your next project. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So I don't know many I don't really know many people in real life. So <laughs> I don't leave the house these days. Um <laughs> <laughs> so you start performing, you start uh, recording stuff. Uh, what, what happens then? You, you hit the you hit the studio. You record an album, EP. At the moment, uh, um, when, when you when you got oh back yes yeah, so, together. So we did a, we did a few of those recordings where it was you know very loose, and I just you know got some videos which I shot on my phone. I threw them up on YouTube and on social media. And, you know, I started promoting, you know, Firetail. I was like, this is my new project. Here, here it comes. And then we got together and we did the first EP, um, which we recorded in the garage. Uh, I worked with Eric, who was my flatmate, as the mixer. Um, oh, that's not us, actually. Is that not you? No, that's a different fire. How does that get in there? I, I never is that understand. Apple Music? Yeah, I don't yeah. know. Because I, I try to get, you know... I try to change that for um, for Spotify, but somehow Apple Music, I haven't got around to getting that sorted. But that's not us. Which was the first EP? First EP is the is Bamboo. Bamboo, there it is. So um, so yeah, we got I got two two guest vocalists to join us, Emily and and um, Christy, who you or Miwa as she goes by, who you heard before on Bamboo. Um, and yeah, we uh, we recorded that. And we got uh, that printed. We got vinyls printed because I love vinyls. Yes. And I'm a believer in vinyls because someone, a friend of mine, I was talking to them about it and I was like, what do you reckon? What's the best thing to do here? You know, do you just go digital? Do you get CDs? Do you get vinyl? And he made a great point. He was like, get vinyl because vinyl collectors are collectors and they love their collection. And if they get your vinyl, it's going to go into their collection. They're going to look after it. Yep. They're, going to, they're going to put it somewhere safe. And you never know what's going to happen in 40 years' time when someone goes through that collection and, and, they, find your, and they find your physical thing. So that made sense to me. And um, we've definitely found that. We've definitely found live when we perform the vinyl sell. We don't sell CDs, you know. Um, Digital sales go okay. But, uh, yeah, so, so we did that first EP and my uh, from my previous experiences in other bands, I know that there's sometimes a tendency, you put so much work towards your first release and you put so much, um, you know, pressure on yourself for it to be good and the best thing that you can do and sometimes you can release that and then you're sort of yeah and, and 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 then you just wait for something to happen like for it to blow up and for you know for everyone to come knocking on your door and go whoa that was amazing you know like let's talk business um so i sort of didn't want to do that i wanted to record that ep and while we were in the process of mastering and getting it you know ready to release we were back in the studio writing songs and we were recording the next EP because I wanted to have that ready to come out um, straight away. And that is sort of the, that's the goal with this band. I don't want to, like now that the new album's coming out, which is amazing, that'll come out probably in the next uh, six or seven months. We'll release a few singles um, in the meantime. But I don't want to sit around and wait and see what happens. I want to get back into the studio and get the next album ready to go. And the next album until we have, you know, Five or six under our belt, then maybe I'll just chill for a little bit. Absolutely. Um, so 
Yeah, the, getting everything off the ground. And so that EP was released in 2020. And then we got hit with the inconvenience, this huge thing that swept the world. And all of a sudden, we're all locked down. You're a hairdresser. You're a musician. And you're in Victoria, where we had the longest lockdown ever. It was like we were caged animals. And what what happened? Where where did you where did your creativity go? Um, it went into. I'll just I'll just move my computer to show you. It went into things like this. Uh, which is a watercolor acrylic painting that I've been doing. Um, ones like this over here on my side wall. Um, basically, I just became a gardener. I went into my backyard every day and, you know, I was like a farmer digging up potatoes and broad beans and just, you know, trying to get out into the yard every day. And then I would come in and I would paint. I'd paint for about seven hours a day. I did about, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd finish, you know, a painting every three or four days. I'd put it out into the internet. And I was very lucky because I've always painted. It's always been something that I've done. Previous to the lockdowns, I had done uh, two exhibitions and I'd sold two paintings. Um, and by the end of the lockdowns, I'd sold 25 paintings. Um, I'd sold paintings to strangers on the internet that I've never met before, which blew my mind because it's one thing to sell a painting to your mum and, <laughs> you know, and, you know, Uncle Steve, you know, that's nice. Yeah. That's great. I'm very, pre thanks, Uncle Steve. <laughs> but when you sell something to a stranger in Portugal who's never met you before, yeah. That's when you go, holy shit, this is actually something that maybe has some legs and maybe I could do. So that's, that's what I did. I, of course, I played music as well. And um, a lot of the songs on the new album, which is just coming out now, they're all lockdown songs, riffs. Um, the, you know, like, like my process for music uh, during those times would be I'd probably sit down for about an hour or two a day on, and I would just jam on the bass, jam, jam, jam. And then in those sessions, there'd probably be like one riff, which I would, you know, play and go, oh, that sounds, that sounds cool. And I'd whip out my phone and I'd hit record. So over that period, over those long lockdown periods, I'd then, you know, after a few months, I'd, I'd go back through my phone and I'd listen to those little riffs and most of them were garbage, which I was like, oh, God, I must have been too high when I was doing that. Got to get, you know, get rid of that. Um, but, yeah, it was a tough time. Um, like, I, you know, I, 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 I got creative and I painted and that was really amazing. But I also went crazy and had a mental breakdown and, you know, lost my shit uh, like we all did. Um, so I wasn't immune to that. But I was, I was very, you know, I was very fortunate to be able to have um, hobbies like music and art, which I can do from home. And uh, one of the things that drove me most insane during that time, because my, my partner, um, Charlie, she, she also is a musician. We've, we've been in bands together before. She plays trumpet and she's a, She's a teacher. She teaches trumpet at schools. So she had to teach from home doing uh, lessons over Zoom. So we were living in a little tiny house. So every single day I heard the same trumpet lessons over and over and over <laughs> that she was teaching to, uh, to like, you know, primary school children. So I'd hear these little trumpet riffs. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, I was, after a few months of that, I was like, if I hear that, that trumpet line one more time, I'm going to lose my mind. <laughs> uh, we've had requests in the chat for your art. So I've just put up your Instagram. Uh, there it is. That's, I'm pretty sure that's the right one for all of your art. Yep, I'm looking at it here. So uh, do I have a desktop view? There we are. Yeah, that's the right one, isn't it? There it is. Yep, that's it. 
See, I know how to use this internet thing. Amazing. <laughs> it was the one thing I forgot to put in there. I'll put it in the description at the end of the show. So, yeah, look, that's that's incredible because you uh, – and uh, I think that's uh, – we talked about this when you were doing my hair when you were here, how artists, uh, uh, th- for all the, the horrible stuff that was going on in the world, artists seem to get this break. We got this moment to breathe and explore other options. And like for me, I started this channel and was able to channel everything into getting gear and setting up something where I could provide a service, provide something with my skills that I've learned over the year and a a place for me to make music live on stream. And it's so beautiful to see the creativity that came out of so many people where there was so much death and destruction and shit going on and we were being bombarded with this stuff. And I mean... When I first saw your art, I just thought, geez, this dude's taken a lot of DMT. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> it is true. And uh, I love it. Um, I love it when people connect with me on, like people will see my art and they'll go, DMT. And I, it's not something I'm trying. I'm not thinking I'm going to do something that's, you know, like a DMT trip. But the fact that people, you know, they see that and they and they uh, somehow it comes through the art. I always joke. I'm like, the drugs have finally paid off. <laughs> they finally paid off. Uh, and I gather you're pretty open to talking about drugs. I I've talked about my experiences with drugs on this program. I've tried every drug under the sun. Um, yeah. My thing is psychedelics. They always will be. I was always trying to find that thing, and it wasn't until I tried DMT that it was like that moment that went. Oh, man, this is it. And it only lasts 15 minutes. Damn, that Joe Rogan dude, everything else he says is horse shit, but he was right about DMT. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it's, very, it's very powerful. Um, I, I think I've always, uh, yeah, I think growing up in country Queensland, you know, um, you know, Weed was my was my first, you know, my first love. And I was like, oh, because I think I was always searching for something because life just seemed so mundane. And I was like, is this it? Is this what people do? You just, you go to the supermarket and, you know, uh, I don't know. I was always searching for something. Then, you know, when I first came to Melbourne, my, my older brother, he gave me my first acid trip. And I fell in love. I was like, ah, if you need me from now on, I will be over here tripping on acid. That's what I'll be doing. And I used to love it. I'd go to the forest, I'd trip. Um, and I thought, I thought that's, I thought, you know, as a young teenager, I thought that was what you did. I thought that's how you became a musician. That's what all my great artists did. I was like, okay, you take a lot of drugs and then you go and, you know, play music and then the world should just sort itself out. And then you top yourself at 27. And then you die at 27 (laughs) in a blazing, you know, ball of glory and the world remembers. And I did, I did. I pushed it too hard, you know, Uh, myself. I pushed it way too hard. I got hospitalised twice before I was 21, woke up handcuffed, hands and feet, to a hospital bed after having some really gnarly bad trips taking LSD. So I'll never take LSD again, unfortunately, because I really did love it. But I got hit by a car the last time I took LSD because I was I was going through some serious psychosis running around the streets of Ascot Vale you in were, Melbourne. You were trying to get hit by a car. <laughs> I was trying to get hit by a car. I was going, uh, you know, and it's weird because I've had that experience where I've almost died, but I still, if I talk to someone who's never had it before, I would never say, don't take it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll give them a little word. I'll be like, just be a bit careful. <laughs> you know, yeah, just, do, don't, don't do, do it, it with a, a psychopath. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Do it, do it in, the right, in, in the right setting and all of that sort of <laughs> yeah. stuff, you know. Um, but I could never say, don't try it because, you know, some of those psychedelic uh drug experiences are the most profane experiences I've had, you know, taking mushrooms, DMT, um, even weed. You know, I love weed. I smoke weed every day. I'm a dreadlock maker. It's part of the job. 
you know. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so the fact that um, my paintings, um, people can relate to them that have had similar experiences and they can see they can see through the paintings that, you know, it comes from a, from a psychedelic place, lots of colors and uh, patterns. Um, that's great, you know. I think the world needs more color and um, yeah, it's just something I'm like, when it comes to art, I'm, I'm sort of like more is more. Just give me more color, give me all the colors I want to get. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to get every single color I can get and put it all together without it being brown, you know? Speaking of color, let's do this. We'll be back shortly, guys. Enjoy this. You're going to love it. Lots of color. This is Axe Painting.
So much versatility. We've got Puss Cam. The cat's the... joined. <laughs> yes. You know, it's interesting on YouTube, whenever there's a fur on, on camera, it changes the whole dynamic of a live stream. <laughs> We've got fur, folks. We've got fur. Oh, Everything's man. changed. <laughs> he had to be a part of it. See the Marshall cat for the win as soon as it happens. Like, forget the music. Cat takes over. Well, uh, cats do win the internet every time, don't they? Well, they win everything, don't they? They own the world. You know, um, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy said that it was going to be dolphins that were going to take the fish and fuck off. It's going to be cats. I don't care. <laughs> they're, like, they're too conniving. They, they've they got all the answers. Uh, hello, Marshall in the chat as well. And uh, Tom Carraher, welcome aboard. What a beautiful song, man. Uh, it's it's so interesting to hear the many faces of this this band. It's just so diverse. I, I never know where you're going to go next. Um, I, I, I just love it so much. Um, and it must be really, really must be very liberating to now be such a good artist as well, to be able to create art for your music as well instead of having to siphon it off to other people to create art. Is, is that a thing now for you? Yeah, I mean, we love... We do love to collaborate, yep. you know, um, so because that that just gives us the opportunity to take it to different places that we wouldn't have gone. So so that that tune there, Axe Painting, um, it's a collaboration with an artist called Happy Axe. And she she plays violin and musical saw, which is really amazing. Um, the musical saw such a ethereal sort of sound. It sounds like a theremin, you know, it's very, very ghostly. And she also does a lot of electronic sort of stuff. Um, and she's got like a, a, a beautiful ethereal voice. So, uh, so yeah, like, I, like working with, with, with Happy Axe, um, we did try to craft that song, you know, around, around her, her sort of vibe and, yeah, that's the that's the beauty of collaborating. It's um, it just it it just it just sort of opens your opens your mind to to different ideas and different different textures. Um, I see many vibes who joined the stream late has asked, uh, d d did he say he makes dreads? Uh, just to backtrack, yeah, this is how we met many vibes uh, last Friday after my show. Jamie came to my house and repaired my dreadlocks to cut off the old fake ones. And actually, you know, took these horrible roots that were all they were terrible and turned them into actual dreads, sitting there picking at them, picking at them while we chatted in my living room about music and drugs and, and all this kind of stuff. And then I invited him on the show. So uh, here we are. Yeah. It, it's, I'm going to, uh, normally I will do like, I have, there's some questions about gear and stuff, but I want to go on this. I want to go down this little path here because I found this interesting. We talked about this. Um, just on your paintings, you told me a story when you were here about sharing a house or sharing a garage in a house and some of your paintings got fucked up. Oh, yeah. Do you want to tell us a, a kind of condensed version of this? Because oh, I would have lost my fucking shit. I would have lost my shit over this. You're a very calm person. Oh, I did. I I did come very close. Um, actually, just give me give me one second. Sure. We've got puss cam. Let's go full screen on puss cam. <laughs> I I just had to um we did close the door because this is this story involves my neighbour and we live very close together. Oh no! <laughs> you don't have to do it. You don't have to go. You can tell me to fuck oh, off. No, no, no. It's all right. It's all right. Um. So yes, we we moved we moved um, to our to our new house, and it's a little unit in Melbourne, and we share a garage with our neighbour. But um, the neighbours actually moved out, and the house was empty next door, and some new neighbours were moving in, and we share this garage. So on my on our half of the garage. We have a bunch of storage. We parked the car there and I had a bunch of uh, paintings stored away, which are watercolour. Um, 
And I had just recently done an exhibition and I had sold uh, two paintings. It's the most I'd ever sold paintings for. It was about $1,300. And one had been picked up and one was waiting to be picked up. And yeah, I one day I just heard this noise of this machinery. And I was like, what the, what is that? And it was coming from the garage. <laughs> and I, I went in there and someone has got a water uh pressure jet and they're just blasting the wall <laughs> and i was like and all my paintings had been moved um outside and i was like what okay and i grabbed my paintings but then i'd noticed uh like a, a, a mist of water had landed on the paintings and because they're watercolor they'd all just melted and dripped oh. <laughs> and i just sold this piece <laughs> so i came out and i i, I didn't know what was going on. i i, I, I I wasn't sure who this person was. I thought it was a cleaner that had been hired by the old owner um, because they were leaving. So that's who I, so I was like, who are you working for? Tell me. <laughs> um, and then it turned out to be our new neighbor. So that's how we met. It was our first meeting. Aye, aye, aye. <laughs> but if we're going to talk about, if we're going to talk about neighbors, Jade, I think your neighbor probably <laughs> Uh, you know, I'll tell you a little story about my neighbour. So most people on the channel know a little bit about him. Last week he dumped a half a room of furniture in my front yard. No idea what for. That's all gone now. It's all gone. But last night before I went to bed, he was out the front where you came in in, in the garage. He was out the front, out the front of my garage. And I didn't know this. He must have been out there for about 20 minutes tell, yelling into the fucking air the story of his life and why he's not a liar. And I caught the end of it. I was in my studio and I'm like, is, what? And I went out and he's fully gone. Oh, and that's the reason I'm not a liar. Good night. And then he went inside. Oh. He must have had this whole dialogue that he was like. And I missed it. I feel terrible. I wish there was a replay I could go back and watch. But dude's mental. Uh, <laughs> yeah. that's uh, Neighbours. That's, it's not like the TV show told us. <laughs> They should have a TV show like a bit more. I suppose they've got a few of those out there. Yeah, houses, <laughs> stuff yeah. like that. Yeah, I don't know what it is, Marshall. I, I really don't know. It's either he's on meth or he's not on drugs. He, or he's not on, not on his meds. Whatever. It's all good. These yeah. things happen. Um, I'm gonna... sometimes, sometimes you just, you know, like I was going to the shops yesterday and someone was walking past me and – I thought maybe they're on their phone, but then I realized that there wasn't any phone or, you know, or anything <laughs> going on. But they said something and I caught it as they walked by. And it was very sad that they just said, no one knows you and you don't belong here. Oh. And, and I heard that and I was like, that's such a sad thing to hear. I sort of wanted to turn around and say, look, I see you, you know, like oh. you belong here. Um but yeah, you know, people out there, uh, they're struggling. It sounds like your neighbor's certainly struggling. He is. Yeah. But I mean, you're struggling as well with having to have a neighbor that's doing some crazy shit in your yard. Well, that, that's you the thing too. That. I, I want to go out and kind of say to him and say, hey, man, do you know what's going on in my life in between my walls and how you're affecting me? But at the same time, I, I don't want to do that because obviously he's got a lot going on that feels the need to do the crazy stuff that he's doing. So I, I just need to move out and it's happening in about a month. So yes, it's all good. It's all good. I'm going to play another song because I want to get in this one and then we're going to end on a brand new track you've just released. So this is So Skinny. You yes. Give us a little bit of a diatribe about this and then we'll come back and wrap up the show. Sure. So, um, so, so skinny, uh, for those that were, were listening earlier to Rainbow Room, uh, this features the same singer, Emily Bennett. Um, I'll just tell you how I first met Emily because uh, I, I was trying to figure out who to work with and my, and my girlfriend suggested Emily. She said, you should go and check her out. So I went to Bar Open and she was performing upstairs with two other women and it was just the three of them in the middle of the room and they were sort of always touching each other and rolling around on the floor in a ball and just going all over the place. And they were singing and they were improvising singing. And so they were just this writhing singing ball 
flopping around on the floor. And I was like, she is awesome. Oh, that, my God. That is such a bar <laughs> open gig. I swear yeah. to God. I swear. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, bar open is a very – very avant-garde venue. It always has been. I've done a gig there where we we went as terrorists and we took the crowd hostage and had fake <laughs> guns and everything, <laughs> and then we smashed up computers with an axe on stage. Whoa. You can do anything you want at Bar Open. It's wild. <laughs> so you you got you got her involved. So yep, spoke to her. Said you know I'd love to work with you, and she came in. She did two tracks: Rainbow Room and So Skinny. Um, again, it was, you know, it's so fun with Emily because, uh, what the, the vocal, um, delivery you're about to hear was not what she came in and sang. She again did about, you know, 10, 20 takes. Every single one was totally different. Um, so what we did, we sort of then went through and we cut up bits and pieces of what she was, um, sort of saying, pieced them together and um, and came up with what we with so skinny. So when we perform this live, she she often joins us, but uh, it's different every time and you never know what it's going to sound like, what she's going to be talking about, where she's going to take it. Um, so yeah, I, I, you know, I've heard this version so many times that to me, it just seems like the version. So it's uh you know it's always interesting to play live and hear what the new version is. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. This is so skinny by Firetail. We'll see you back shortly, guys. Boom.
fuck me drunk. That was awesome. <laughs> I got goosebumps. Oh, look at that. I literally have goosebumps. <laughs> <laughs> that was crazy, man. I, I kept thinking during that middle bit when it just became a wall of sound, I'm like, oh, God, I've got to listen to this on DMT. <laughs> 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 I, I have to. <laughs> uh, I've got to get myself some DMT now. <laughs> Jesus Christ. That was sick. So that tune, um, uh, uh, after we, we released that song, I got this message from this American guy and he was like, he sent me like a Facebook message. He was like, holy shit, man. I just, you know, heard so skinny on the radio. Where can I buy that? Where can I get it? You know? And I was like, oh, wow. Amazing. You know, thank you so much. And then he said, oh, he's like, oh, I've got a, I do a, I've got a, a, a YouTube channel. And he had, you know, a bunch of, of, of subscribers. And he was like, would it be okay if I made a video? And I was like, Sure. I had no idea what he meant or what that, you know, entailed. But uh, he then, he then made a, um, he made uh, this, this video and it was called Listen to Firetail Now. And it went on for about eight minutes. And it was just him. Cause he, he, he's a guitarist. He's a, he's a shredding um, guitarist. He plays all that sort of like Van Halen sort of stuff. He's sick. Um, so, yeah, and it's just him. Just, he's like, I, I, was, I was in my car and, you know, I heard this song and then I had to like, you know, uh, like I, I pulled over so I, I, I could listen to the radio presenter, give me the name and, you know, and it goes on and on and on. And it was so like touching and awesome for us to hear that we had like, you know, um, connected with this guy that what we ended up doing, we ended up cutting up that YouTube clip and we used his voice all through our next EP. Right. Um, because I was just like, man, if you love it so much, I'll put you in the next EP. <laughs> like you can, you can be in there. Uh, so the next EP is just this American dude talking about how much he was just like, you know, loving that tune in particular. And it's like, you know, it's so good. It's really, really fun. <laughs> I, I love that creativity. Uh, so you're about to go on tour now. So you've got an album that's about, uh, is it an EP that's dropping? Next. Uh, this is our first full length album. Full length album. Uh, yes. And then you're going on tour. And here are the tour dates if you're in Australia. Uh, so you're kicking off in uh, seven days' time, Friday, March 10th, in Beechworth. Then we're off to March 11th, Kiama. Most people outside of Australia will be going, what are these weird names? You're playing in <laughs> Shepparton. Shepparton on the 17th. Chef, watch Chef out, Arton. Watch out for those two-headed people there. Um, <laughs> Ballarat, where, uh, kind of close to where I grew up, in Bacchus Marsh. So Ballarat's a little bit past there. Yarra Rangers, is uh, is that a, a winery or something? Oh, actually, no, I got that wrong. Um, I, did an oh. interview, I did an interview yesterday for PBS and... After the interview, the uh, organizer of that festival said, hey, hey, Jamie, I heard that interview. Great. But uh, the festival hasn't been in Yarra Ranges for years now. It's in oh. Gippsland. <laughs> Gippsland. Like, there we go. Amendment. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 15th in Hobart. There's some real two-headed people. <laughs> um, <laughs> two gigs in Hobart. So uh, that's cool. Uh, what else have we got? We've got we, just- I, I actually just got a third one just as we were doing this interview. Awesome. In Hobart. So that's just come through. Um, so then we've got Melbourne. So I know I saw, uh, um, Cold Acre say in the chat, he wants to come and see you when you're in Melbourne. Maybe we should go together. Uh, James in the chat we should go to, what is it? Shot kickers. We'll go and see, uh, the band. And then in Mornington, I reckon Melbourne's the one we'll go to. Um, so that's coming up. Uh, when does the album drop? Cause you've just dropped a single. Just dropped the single. Um, at the moment, there's no, there's no, um, date for right. the a- actual album we still have to do two days of mixing just to finish off the tracks and we're gonna you know just r- release probably another uh maybe three singles over the you know the, the the following months you know how it is trying to get the spotify algorithms to uh you know pay it's some a- attention it's already it's already out on apple music the single too that's right yes yeah. so so um this our latest single Paper Mache Cave is out everywhere, uh, or it should be out everywhere by today. Um, yeah, so probably probably ended towards the end of the year for the album. Awesome, awesome stuff. Um, so we're going to end today, just so you guys know, with the brand new single, and it's it's wicked. I love it. Uh, it dropped last night. I got the notification on Bandcamp. Was like, yoink, 
Yep. I haven't bought it yet. I will buy it after this show. Um, it's wicked. Um, so we're, we're, we're close to the end now. We're probably going to finish on time today. Normally I'm pushing it. So, But I will hit you up with the final question I ask everybody on this show. Um, if you were giving advice to someone just starting out making music, being creative, whatever it is they, they want to take up, when would you suggest being the best time for them to start doing it? Oh, well, of course, instant straight away. Um, <laughs> yeah, just now, now. Uh, and all like the formula to being creative and to do it, you know, it, it's easy. All you have to do is do it. That's all you got to do. And you just got to keep on doing it and you enjoy it. And if it, and, and it makes you happy. And, um, and then as long as you don't want to stop doing it, then you, you just keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it. And you'll always be content no matter what, because I'm just as happy performing live in front of people as I am by myself in my bedroom playing music to myself with no one around. That makes me just as happy as anything. Right on, right on, right on. Um, I want to thank you for coming on the show and, and sharing a little bit about your story and how, who you are and how, how you make music. Um, I also want to thank you too for coming to my house and fixing my hair and just hanging out. It was a wicked afternoon uh, just hanging out with another human being <laughs> like – kind of uh, gets me the, the feeling goes both ways like your your music is amazing so thank you for sharing that Thanks with me like friend. i was i was blown away because it's like you said it earlier like you know um you know I, i'll often talk to people and they you know and, and 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 they'll talk about their music and you know it's it's hard when you listen to someone's stuff and you know you're like oh yeah it's it's okay <laughs> Whereas I can genuinely, <laughs> honestly say your music blew me away. And I was like, holy Thanks, shit, this is amazing, you know? So that is rare. So, um, yeah, it definitely goes both ways. Thank you for inviting me onto this. This has been amazing. And I just want to say this because I, I, I've been doing some, some radio interviews, um, but this setup, like having your, having your listeners involved and seeing their comments pop up throughout, you know, listening to the songs has been really amazing. So thank you to everyone out there for such beautiful words it's really like uh it's a it, it's it's uh a strange way of uh having an interview but it's amazing it's I, I, I feel like i'm sort of there with you all so thank you for having me it's been very much my pleasure absolutely it's so interactive i love it i love this kind of uh interview it's a, it's a great space to do it in now one day I would love, and I'm just going to put you on the spot. I don't give a fuck. That's how the way I roll. I would love to do something with you and just scream some sounds on one of some of your music at some stage. So we'll come and see oh, you play yeah. live. Definitely, for sure. I, I would love just to do something. Your, your music is so up my alley and I've, I've done stuff with similar bands like you before and just, and, you know, hearing the other vocalists who've just done crazy stuff. I love doing crazy stuff. So maybe one Let's day we can work together. It's very rare that I work with people because you've got to like, I've really got to dig you to even say, oh, blah, 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 please. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, a collab would be awesome, man. I would kill for that. So yes, let's that would be great. Let's play this track. Let's get out of here today with this. This is Paper M Mash Cave. Is it or Mache? Is it A? Say Mache? Paper mache. Paper, Paper mache. mache. I, I, I just assumed mache had an E on it for some reason. I don't know. <laughs> Paper mache cave is available now on Bandcamp. The link was put in the chat. All the links to Firetail and everything are in the description. I'll put the Instagram link in for Jamie's art as well after the show. Stay on the line with me too once the show ends so I can say goodbye to you off the air, please, uh, Jamie. Oh, wait, Jade, you're right. That is spelled wrong. That, that's, that's, I've, got to go, I've got to go on Bandcamp and fix that. That's not how you spell paper mache. Oh. All right. So thanks, for, uh, thanks for pointing that out. All right. That's all right. That's what we it's do my here. First day. <laughs> paper mache spelled incorrectly. It doesn't really fucking matter, does it? Because it's all about the music. I'm going to fix that. Let, <laughs> let's play this now. We'll get out of your hair for the day. And Pete Johns is up next, so I'll dump you over to him straight after the show. And he's got Georgie Johns on the show for his podcast. And after that, Ron Ward's got a show coming up with Brad Example. And 
uh, Russ8889. So stick in for the, all the day's entertainment here on YouTube. Let's play this. Let's get out of here. Thank you so much, Jamie. Do the things that make you happy. Mistakes make you better. Remember, folks, we'll all rise together. Let's do this. together 